Good morning again. Today we're continuing our series on the three angels' messages, and particularly we've been studying the first angel's message. Last week we were discussing about the historical background to the message and the necessity that God had in giving his people a special message for the end time. Just as we saw in the history of the way God deals with people, he doesn't allow judgment or calamity to come without some kind of warning first. And like with the Amorites, later with the Israelites and others, he would pronounce warnings and then the judgments might come. Today we want to talk about the pillars of our faith and how they tie in with the three angels' messages. And I think that you're going to find this to be um, perhaps partly a review, I think very informative and I think very helpful in understanding how all this ties together into current events that we need to understand as well. But I'd like to go back first in Revelation 14 and read again verses 6 and 7 with you. If you would open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Now, before we read that, let me just ask you again, what happens or what do we read about? What is the big issue in Revelation 13, the chapter just before this? The mark of the beast. God knows this mark of the beast of issue is coming in this world, and so therefore he sends a message to prepare God's people so that they can avoid the mark of the beast, so that they have a message to proclaim to others that this may be avoided if they wish. But in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Now, the first part of this message in verse 6, it lists or it gives the instrumentalities God will use in giving the message, a most basic overview of the message, and the extent that the message is to cover, or the, the, the geographical error, if you please, over which it is to be given. Now, it says it's given by an angel. This is the first of what we call three angels. And in both the Hebrew language of the Old Testament and the Greek language of the New Testament, the term that we translate angel simply means messenger. And it's sometimes uh, applied to people. The same word that we translate for angel, we apply to people. Let me just give you a couple references. One is in Job 1.14, and I have the reference here for you on the screen if you like. But uh, it says, And there came a messenger, the Hebrew is Malak, unto Job, and said, The oxen were plying, and the asses feeding beside them. And then he goes on to speak about the destruction that came. But the word that we have here in English, messenger, is from this Hebrew word, Malak, and it is translated many times, in fact, uh, uh, over half the times that we find it used in the Old Testament as angel or angels. This chart shows you graphically how this word is used in the Old Testament. Angel or angels, uh, a couple times as ambassadors, and several times simply as messenger, referring to individuals. Another example of that is in 1 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 3. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days' respite, that we may send messengers, Malak, unto all the coasts of Israel, and then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Remember, these men were coming, and they were going to put out the eyes of these men and kill them. And they said, Oh, give us a little time. And, of course, they sent for help, and, and God brought help to them. In the New Testament, in Luke chapter 7 and verse 24, and when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But in this verse, in the beginning of it, when it speaks about messengers, this is from the word angelon, which is from angelos. And it's, angelos is the lemma or the basic uh, word that we translate angel. And so angelon is simply a variation of it. But these were messengers. They were human beings. And yet... We also translate this word angel in other places. Also, um, here in fact you see that it is usually translated angels, but it's translated messenger seven times in the New Testament. Okay, 
Another place is in Luke chapter 9 and verse 52. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And here we see that, again, it's from the basic Latin word, angelos, for angel. And so when it speaks here in Revelation 14 about a first angel, a second angel, uh, a third angel, it's speaking about messengers because we realize that it's not going to be a literal angel, uh, a, a being that is angelic in nature, you know, but it's going to be people who are angels in function. Do you understand the difference between being an angel in nature and an angel in function? An angel is a messenger, right? There are what we call heavenly beings that are angels. We think of them having wings, being able to fly, being able to swiftly come to the earth. They share God's message. They do His bidding. They are angels not only in function but in nature. We are not an angel like that in nature, but we can be an angel in function. We have the function of being a messenger. Even Christ is called the archangel. He is a messenger of God, isn't he? But he's not an angel in function in, in nature like the angels, but he's an angel by function. You see. Christ is also called in Hebrews 3:1 an apostle. He's an apostle of God. Apostles one sent. He was sent of God. See? He was an apostle in nature, necessarily like the twelve, although he did take human flesh. But he's an apostle by function. And so these angels represent men and women, giving a message from God. And that message is called the everlasting gospel. And the extent of its promulgation is to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now the second part of this message in verse 7 gives the intensity and the means by which it is given and its specific content. Now there are three verbs that form a part of this command in verse 7 and none of which should be overlooked. And on our screen here, we have these three verbs and what we are to do. It says we are to fear God. We are to fear to reverence God. We are to give glory to Him. And we are to worship God specifically as the Creator, as the one who created all things. And the reason for this reference is given. He says because the hour of His judgment has come. These parts of the message are all interwoven with each other and with the everlasting gospel. To be ready for the judgment, one must properly worship and respect the God of the judgment. The standard of the judgment must be understood. In the command to worship God as the Creator, we find a call to return to the keeping of not only all the commandments, but specifically the fourth commandment, the commandment that talks about creation. Now, within these messages, and we find an interlocking, an an, an interrelationship between these different messages, we find really the part and parcel of Adventism and all that it is. Now, in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 1, if we could turn there, The scripture says that wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. Now, we don't usually think of wisdom, maybe, as as someone who has a house, someone who's hewn out her seven pillars. But in Proverbs 8, in the chapter just before this, wisdom is spoken of there. And we understand that this wisdom is in making reference to Jesus Christ. Now you say, well, why is it spoken of as her in verse 9? And the reason is that uh, Hebrew is a gender-based language, and the word wisdom in Hebrew is a feminine word. It has to be translated her. But it represents Christ. And in Hebrews, I'm sorry, in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it speaks about wisdom here, introduces wisdom here, Uh, in this chapter, although it's been spoken of prior also, and it says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places by the way, in the places of the paths. And then in verses 15 and 16, it says, By me, referring to wisdom, by me kings reign, and princes decree justice. 
By me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. And, you know, we might be we might be thinking, well, yes, you know, kings use wisdom, princes use judgment and wisdom in their decree, yes. But when you think about that and compare it with Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, there Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changeth the times and the seasons. And what else does he do? He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. And so... Wisdom sets up kings. It gives them their reign. And then in back in Proverbs 8 again, in verses 22 through 25, it's, it says, Wisdom says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth forth, and the Hebrew means begot, I was begotten. And we understand that this is speaking about Jesus Christ. He is the, he is the wisdom of God. And so, wisdom, Christ has his seven pillars. Seven pillars. Now, it's interesting to note that the three angels' messages have been defined by Ellen White as pillars of the faith. Ellen White states that the first and second angels' messages and the third are landmarks and pillars of our faith. And in fact, I'd like to look at a statement that she says, and then we're going to expand on it a little bit, where she speaks about the pillars of our faith. And this is from the book Councils to Writers and Editors on page 31. It says, The passing of time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. Also, the first and second angel's messages and the third unfurling the banner on which was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And she says also, One of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God, seen by his truth-loving people in heaven, and the ark containing the law of God. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. And those are all the things that she mentions in this particular statement. But it's not all that she writes about it. Now, the banner of the three angels' messages, she says that interconnected with this are the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus. She speaks about the sanctuary message, the ark with the law highlighting the Sabbath in particular, and the non-immortality of the wicked. Now, nothing seems to be specifically mentioned, though, about the doctrine of God. Surely the doctrine of God must be a pillar. Nearly all biblical students acknowledge the doctrine of God to be the most fundamental doctrine of all. And even the Catholic Church declares that their concept of God is the very foundation of their structure. In the book Handbook for Today's Catholic, on page 16, it says the doctrine of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it, that is the doctrine of the Trinity, upon it are based all the other teachings of the Church. We don't have time to, to, to discuss all these other teachings today, but if you think about the immortal soul, eternal hell, Purgatory, Mary, all those things come out of the doctrine of the Trinity in one place or another. The very first commandment, though, of the Ten Commandments, forbids false worship. In Exodus chapter 20, in verses 1, 2, and 3, we read, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In fact, the first four commandments deal with our worship of God. Was Ellen White then uninformed when she did not specifically mention the doctrine of God in the statement that we read earlier from the book Councils to Writers and Editors? Of course she wasn't. Within the first angel's message, we find the command to fear or to reverence and to give glory to God. 
And friends, you cannot do this with a false concept of God. If my concept of God is some kind of uh, Hindu spirit or Buddha or even the, the God of Islam, Allah, and I try to worship that God, is, is that acceptable to the God of heaven? Is that acceptable to the great Jehovah, friends? No. Not a bit. Not a bit. But you know, we have this, con this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's in Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 174. And there she says, Thousands have a false conception of God and His attributes, and they are as verily serving a false god as were the servants of Baal. We think back to the days of Elijah. And when Elijah was on Mount Carmel, he says, The Lord be God, follow him, and they'll follow him. But he did not believe these were uh, con um, contemporary, complementary gods. He was setting Baal in contradistinction to Jehovah. And we are told that if we have a false conception of God, maybe he's supposed to be the true God, the Christian God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But if we have a false conception of him, we are worshiping that conception of God, not the God himself. And we're just serving a false God as much as the children of Israel who are serving Baal. In other words, friends, false ideas about God lead to false worship, which cannot, cannot in any manner give glory to God. Amen. We are told further in the book Ministry of Healing by Ellen White. She says, A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and of all true service. It is the only real safeguard against temptation. It is this alone that can make us like God in character. Let me just pause for a minute. You know, our sanctification, friends, the blotting out of the record in heaven is not an arbitrary decree or act of God. It's the result of what has happened in my character on earth. It's the result of my character becoming like the character of God and so fixed that it will not change. And because of that, now God says, I can blot out his sin. I can blot out the record of sin that has been held provisionally, if you please, in case I repent of my repentance. She continues in Ministry of Healing. She says, this is the knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of God. She's speaking about the knowledge of God. She says, This is the knowledge needed by all who are working for the uplifting of their fellow men, transformation of character, purity of life, efficiency in service, adherence to correct principles, all depend upon a right knowledge of God. This knowledge is the essential preparation both for this life and the life to come. She doesn't say it's just an or a essential preparation. It's the essential preparation. There's nothing that supersedes this. Now Ellen White says that this knowledge, this knowledge of God is essential. What many people do not know is that Ellen White did specifically address and mention the doctrine of God and Christ as being pillars of our faith. Because in the statement of councils and writers and editors, it's not mentioned there. And if you continue reading that statement, she actually says, well, I can't think of anything else at this time. But she did not say there's nothing else. She just said, at this moment, that's the ones I can think of. But maybe she had some of these, these very concepts in mind when she's speaking about the three angels' messages. Because, as again, all of these interlock. You know, we, we have, beloved, we have a systematic theology unlike anyone in this world. Amen. Because every part of it fits. And they interlock together. But in the book, You Shall Receive Power, on page 235, and this actually comes from Manuscript 62, published in 1905. She says, Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Now she's speaking about old landmarks, right? In 1905, I'm, I'm talking about old landmarks now, she says. And then she says, those who would try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary 
or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. Did Ellen White ever mention something about the doctrine of God as an old landmark, as a pillar of our faith? She absolutely did. And so, if anyone tells you that the truth about God or the Godhead or this business about God, as they might call it, is not important, they're simply speaking, friends, from an uninformed position. Amen. Okay? It's just an uninformed position. They may be very sincere, but they just don't understand the depths of what all this means. She goes on to say, They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and set the people of God adrift without an anchor. Friends, we need an anchor to hold us Amen. in these days and in these times. And so, God has hewed out His seven pillars. Christ has done this, and this is just a, um, a little chart that I've made up that mentions some of these pillars of our faith as we would maybe understand them. The law and the Sabbath, the personality of God in Christ, the faith of Jesus, the sanctuary, the three angels' messages, the testimony of Jesus, which we didn't mention now, in um, the sixth pillar over toward the second one from the right, uh, volume 1, page 300 of the Testimonies, and the non immortality of the wicked. Um, but we didn't give a reference for that one. But the others we've sort of made refer references to or spoken of. But all of those things, if you really think about it, they're all involved in the Three Angels' Messages. See? That's why I can say the Three Angels' Messages is part and parcel of what we're doing. It's, it's really the entirety of it. Now, she wrote this last statement in 1905. And it's interesting because if you look at the historical context, right? And again, you know, as, as uh, was it Cicero said, that if we, if we don't learn these lessons uh, from the past, we're going to be condemned to make them for the future or whatever. But we have to know the history. In 1905, there were two concurrently running theological crises in the turn of the century in Adventism. I don't know if you realize this, but there were actually two theological crises that were occurring in the church at the same time. One, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg and his teachings of pantheism in the book, The Living Temple. You've probably have heard about that, haven't you? Yeah. But there was also a man by the name of Albion Ballinger, or A.F. Ballinger, his middle initial F, his middle name was Fox. Maybe it wasn't so inappropriate. Albion Fox Ballinger. And he brought challenges to the sanctuary message. Now, I want you to carefully notice that Ellen White, writing concerning the issues with Ballinger's challenge to the sanctuary, she links the personality of God in Christ with the sanctuary as a landmark or pillar that must not be removed. Because the statement we read from Ye shall receive power, this statement was a statement that she was writing concerning what was going on with Ballinger at that time. You go back and you get the original manuscript, you read the whole context of it, see? And so she understood that this person I've got in Christ was important, but she connects it with the sanctuary doctrine that, that Ballinger was also bringing uh, attack against. The spirit of prophecy understood then that these two teachings were interrelated, and a person could not move one without producing an effect upon the other. And this is so true. You see, just think about the doctrine of the Trinity for a minute. Doctrine of Trinity says Christ is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, right, in every respect. And he is not in any way a subordinate to the Father. But if you're going to have a sanctuary, and you're going to have to have a sacrifice, someone has to die, and someone has to be a mediator. But how can Christ be a mediator between man and God if he's that God himself? You see, one starts to tear down the other very quickly. Now, this statement, by the way, that uh, Ellen White wrote again was in 1905, seven years after the Desire of Ages had been published, a book which some historians today claim was Ellen White's subtle attempt to change the church's Christology. But she says here in 1905 that this is an old landmark and we're not to change it. Now, let's just go through a brief history of some of Kellogg's thinking because I think it's essential to understand and to have an understanding of the importance of the doctrine of God among Adventists. On October the 28th of 1903, Dr. Kellogg wrote a letter to G.I. Butler. G.I. Butler was a worker who had been around a long time. He had been the General Conference president before. 
And Kellogg wrote this to Butler. He says, as far as I can fathom, the difficulty which is found in the living temple, the whole thing may be simmered down to this question. Is the Holy Ghost a person? You say no. I had supposed the Bible said this for the reason that the personal pronoun he is used when speaking of the Holy Ghost. Kellogg goes on to write, Sister White uses the pronoun he and has said in so many words that the Holy Ghost is the third person of the Godhead. How the Holy Ghost can be the third person and not be a person at all is difficult for me to see. That's the issue today, too. And, you know, it, it is, as, as Brother Mike says, the issue today, too. And, you know, it's, it's probable here that there was a, a misunderstanding, at least to a degree, in some of the terminology used, you know. Butler probably perceiving the concept of person as, as the same equivalent of a being or a separate individual. See, that wasn't what Ellen White was speaking about, but you can see how Kellogg could have used these statements, just like people use them today. And in fact, Kellogg claimed that he was simply quoting the testimonies, and he gives a long list of several references that he claims that he was quoting from. We can show those another day. But now the next day, on October 29 of 1903, then the, general, then the current General Conference President, A.G. Daniels, wrote a letter to Willie White, the son of Ellen White, concerning the pantheistic views of Kellogg. And notice what uh, Daniels writes to White. He says he, referring to Dr. Kellogg, then stated that his former views regarding the Trinity had stood in his way of making a clear and absolutely correct statement, but that within a short time he had come to believe in the Trinity and could now see pretty clearly where all the difficulty was, and believed that he could clear up the matter satisfactorily. Continues. He told me now that he believed in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, and his view was that it was God the Holy Ghost and not God the Father that filled all space and every living thing. He said that if he had believed this before writing the book, he could have expressed his views without giving the wrong impression the book now gives. Earlier in his letter, Daniels had noted concerning Kellogg. He said that some days before coming to the council, he had been thinking the matter over and began to see that he had made a slight mistake in expressing his views. He felt sure that he believed just what the testimonies teach and what Dr. Wagoner and Elder Jones have taught for years, but he had come to believe that none of them had expressed the matter in correct form. He's saying it's semantics. Have you ever heard people say that? Mm. I believe just what Ellen White believes. I believe just what Jones and Wagner believe. They just didn't express it the best way. I've expressed it in a better way. That's what Kellogg was saying. Kellogg thought that he taught what Ellen White, Jones, and Wagner taught, but again, they had expressed it poorly, and he was writing better. A.G. Daniels wrote to Kellogg, and Daniels said, Now you can readily see that all this cannot be corrected by simply a change of terms. To Daniel's credit, he was astute enough to understand that this was not and could not be limited to just the semantics of the issue. Further, Daniels noted to Willie White that before his mother Ellen White had come out against the book uh, Living Temple, Kellogg had given an, uh, quote, fair warning that this battle would be fought out to the bitter end and that old traditional theories would be rolled under. Before Ellen White said anything about the book, Kellogg had said, I'm giving you fair warning, this battle is going to be fought, and the old views are going to be rolled under. During the outset of the controversy, Kellogg acknowledged they had a new model of thought. And it reminds me of what Ellen White says in the Second Angel's message, that these young people came along and they were going to new model the cause. And Kellogg was going to come along and new model the cause. He had a new model of thought that went beyond just the expression of his words. But friends, praise God that Daniels was not deceived by Kellogg's attempt to change the manner of expressing his thoughts. And Daniels wrote to Willie White in October 29 of 1903. He says, I felt fully satisfied that he had not changed his views in any essential particular. Now, came, Kellogg came to his pantheistic views at least in part because of his acceptance of the Trinitarian doctrine. And in the early part of the 20th century, we find Satan making two distinct attacks upon Adventism, striking at these two main pillars of the movement through Dr. Kellogg 
and the truth about God, and through Ballinger and the sanctuary truth. Inseparably tied to the personality of God and the sanctuary doctrine is the concept that we call this everlasting gospel. What's supposed to be being preached by the three angels, and especially the first angel in Revelation 14? And if we go back to Ellen White's most often quoted statement on the pillars and landmarks, the one that we read from Council's writers and editors on page 31, the phrase gospel, friends, is never used in that statement. Isn't that interesting? The phrase gospel isn't used. But we know that the gospel is, 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 is paramount. And therefore, we, we, we make a very logical and honest and clear deduction that the gospel is part of what's being presented in those pillars. And one of them is the first angel's message. And the first angel's message is to give the everlasting gospel. That's right. Another point that's never mentioned is the nature of Christ. It's not specifically mentioned. But yet, Ellen White wrote this in Youth Instructor of October 13, 1898. She says, The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. Should we conclude that the message of the gospel, the message that, that Paul said in, in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing of, to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is to me if I preach not the gospel. Can we imagine that this message that God gave doesn't include these, these important paramount issues? can't think that. We must know that it does include those things. The message of the gospel is included. The message of these important things have to become a part of our faith. And they are within the three angels' messages, and specifically the first angels' message. Concerning the pillars of our faith, God has sternly warned us, friends, that they are not to be moved. In Councils to Writers and Editors, again on page 26, Ellen White says, The proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages has been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or pin is to be removed. Not a peg or a pin is to be removed. She also noted in the book, Medical Ministry, she says, let us take heed then how we build. Let us take heed then how we build. Let no one build unwisely. The word of God is our only foundation. Every semblance of error will come upon us. Some of these errors will be very specious and attractive. But if received, they would remove the pillars of the foundation that Christ has established and set up a structure of man's building. She continues, There are those who seeing see not, and hearing hear not. And under Satan's guidance, they prepare false foundations for human minds. We might appeal. We might appeal for the brethren to come together in unity, in prayer, and to try to resolve our issues, and to look for God to lead us in some new way, for the voice of God to speak in some new way, and give us direction, friends. But I want to tell you, He's already given us the direction. He's already told us what the pillars of our faith are and what we are to believe and how we are to live. And if I have to look for something new, I have a lack of faith in what's, what He's already given me, friends. God has bestowed upon this people, especially through the spirit of prophecy, His spirit in a unique way. And I don't need to look for a new manifestation to explain to me what we should be doing and what we should be teaching. We already have it. We have it. And um, I think back in Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 18. In verse 1. Now Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, who, what kingdom was he king over? 
Not a trick question. Come on. Jotha. Who was the king over? <coughs> Judah. That's right. Was he considered, by and large, a good king or a bad king? It's, yeah, we mostly consider Jotha a good king. Did some good things. He had riches and honor and abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. Who was Ahab? Well, he was a good guy, right? Ahab was a real righteous guy from the king of the north, Israel. Oh, Ahab, Ahab had the most wicked wife we can ever imagine. If there's ever been a more wicked woman than Jezebel, I don't know who she is. But he joined affinity with Ahab. That meant that he gave his son to Ahab's daughter for marriage. And this would help cement and bind them together, form an alliance. Remember Athaliah? She wasn't so great either, was she? Killed off the king's seed afterwards. And they got together and they decided that they were going to go together and invade Ramoth Gilead. Remember? And God sent Jehoshaphat a message to a prophet, don't you dare do this. But Jehoshaphat did it anyhow. And he almost lost his life. Ahab did lose his life in that adventure. In 2 Chronicles 19, and verse 1, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem, and Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to meet him and said to king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. He says, how dare you join up with Babylon? How dare you have affinity and join up and hobnob with these people who don't love me? We will talk about the second angel's message later. These things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And if we can't learn these lessons, friends, if we don't understand what the pillars of our faith are, how they tie into the three angels' messages, how they affect the everlasting gospel, then it's time that we find out and know where we stand and why we stand for what we stand. In Psalms 11 and verse 3, he says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the implied answer is nothing. The implied answer is if you let the foundations be destroyed, you are in trouble. And that's where we are at to a great degree as a people. Friends, may God help us as we study these issues to know what our pillars are and to obey those pillars and to not, not forsake them. This is not the time to throw the spirit of prophecy out and say, well, it's failed me. I, I, I can't depend upon it anymore. This is not a time, friends, to redefine the nature of Christ and, 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 and the, the, the nature of sin and to try to redo our sanctuary doctrine. It's not the time to throw the mark of the beast out and then join affinity with those who do. Amen. It's not the time. And God, God asks the question, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? And my answer is we must not and we must say no to that. May God bless you lots and lots.